Um, this uh, question of, of constancy of tempo, which you've made very clearly, and I think very authoritatively, uh, does that apply equally well, for example, to Mozart? I think it does, yes. Um, yes, I, I would say so. I have just finished recording a sonata which every student plays, and for that reason, when I was a student, I didn't play it, because I was a very stubborn student, and I didn't like to play the things that my colleagues were playing. And that is a sonata that has the march in the Turkish style, yada pa pam pa 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 you know that one. Um, and which I think is, I think is usually, no, I think it is usually played uh, as sort of a cherny exercise tempo, or something. And indeed, I did it as though it were a scene out of um, Abduction from the Seraglio, very mock Turkish and very pomposo and very yada pa 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 <laughs> well, I, I used it as the sort of um, final accumulation of, of a whole method with this sonata, which, as I say, I really didn't know. I had, I had bypassed it always and had heard the traditional performances of it and had no, you know, a priori conception of my own until about a week before. And indeed, I went to the studio on the afternoon when it was to be recorded, not quite convinced that I was going to bring this thing off. You know, it could have fallen flat on its face. I don't think it did. But um, I did introduce there some really wild things. As you remember, the, the first movement of that sonata is theme and variations. And the theme is sort of uh, nice and pleasant. It's the sort of thing that Jose Turby would be playing if he were still making movies, you know, to, to some enchanted lady draping her handkerchief over the balcony or something. And uh, I think it's usually played uh, relatively quickly. But in fact, what I did with it was to turn it in, the theme only, not the variation, to turn it into a sort of uh, Anton Webern-like statement of apostrophes, something like this. You'll be shocked. You are shocked. shocked. Just play it how you, Hollywood would play it. Well, I, I think Hollywood would play it with, with strings, of course, dubbed in. wrong with that? Well, nothing really, except that it takes all the juice out of it, because um, what I was trying to do was to play it so maddeningly slowly that in, I had to get at that moment, everybody's hackles aroused, I had to get a reaction. Um, and having got that reaction with this incredibly apostrophe, apostrophe'd performance... <laughs> I gradually let out each variation a little bit more than the one before in this fashion. And so on, that is the first variation. Then a little bit more. and so on, and then finally, doing one really perverse thing, and that is taking a variation that Mozart has, forgive me, actually marked adagio, and turning it into uh, an allegretto, and that came out like this. And gradually, the whole movement took off. And um, it's, it's a very, very um, peculiar thing to it's do. It's a very arbitrary thing to do. But it works. I can only tell you it works. And it works on um, a work that I hope, for most people, has become sufficiently jaded that, that they'll say, ah. On the other hand, they may say, ah. You know, one never knows. But that's but, really but what you're aiming to do, is to make people sit up on their seats from the first note and say, this is an event. This is a happening. Yes. Almost, a if you want happening. it in one word, yes, indeed. Yes. I think this is the role. I think this is what um, the only thing performers have left to do in this day of super recording techniques and super recording artists and super recording engineers. I think that all the basic statements have been made for posterity now. And I think what we must do uh, is try to find our way around these things, try to find a raison d'etre that is somehow different and still somehow right, that, that makes sense. I think if it does not, if it does not really make sense, uh, one must chuck it out, you know, and I would, uh, indeed, I would have said that two days after having made that record, um, had I not listened to it in a playback booth and thought, you know, that really is fun and it really does make sense and it really does say something about the architecture of that particular work, um, then I would have chucked it out and gone back and done it as Hollywood would prefer. 
But um, I do believe it made sense. Um, I've noticed that in some of your records, you uh, bring out the Emperor Concerto, for example, you played me the other day, and some of the Mozart pieces I've been hearing while I've been here in Toronto that yes. you've played me, that you place an enormous amount of importance on the left hand. Yes. The, what, what would normally be an accompanying figure, kept quiet. Yes. Uh, now, why do you do this? I think perhaps you ought to just uh, well, yeah, I th yes, let play me, a bit. Let me say only that I think it has to do with two things. First of all, that I have an inordinate fondness for all music that is in the least contrapuntal. And if it isn't contrapuntal, I try to make it contrapuntal. I try to invent happenings for inner voices, even if they don't really exist. Mm -hmm. um, I, that's considerable confession, and I, I shall get a lot of bad reviews from having admitted it, probably, but who cares? Um, and the other thing is that I did, in my earlier days, play the organ. And if you play the organ, you develop an acute sense of bass line and of pedal thinking. You tend to manipulate things with your feet. Mm -hmm. um, and you tend to become very conscious of, of bass line, in this sense. Uh, and I think this is an experience that awaits most, most pianists. They, should, they could, might well use it. Um, well, yes, let me, let me try to show you the difference. I don't say that it makes better Mozart. It makes, again, a rather arbitrary experience, but I think it somehow adds vitamins to the music. Do um, you remember the, uh, let me see, do you remember the Sonata Kershaw 333, the one that has uh, this tune? <laughs> That is a good tune, and it is the tune, after all, in the, in the movement. Um, and I think it's customary to hear it played something like this. And in, in my version, what I tried to do was something like this. I suppose make Mozart into a Baroque composer, you know? Play, play that sequence again as it might be played if I was playing it. right in thinking, no, it wasn't bad. Thank you. <laughs> Am I right, do you think, perhaps, in thinking that everything that you play stems, in a way, from your first admiration and study of Bach? Yes, it does. It really does. Um, I suppose it's wrong, in a way, to, to apply uh, principles that are valid for the Baroque experience and that, that work marvelously in the performance of Bach to other composers. But uh, Bach was the reason I became a musician, I think, love of Bach. Uh, and it has permeated everything else that's mm. interested me in intervening years, to some extent. One has to discipline it, one has to control it, and there are times when you simply have to draw the line and say that's silly, you know, you can go too far, undoubtedly. Uh, I'm not saying on occasion I, I have not. I know you objected to the Emperor Concerto to the second movement, to the fact that I played somehow the left-hand figurations in a way that uh, upset the balance of the theme, mm. I think. <laughs> argument to you, as you well know, was that having heard the theme once played by the orchestra and already embroidered by the piano, one in fact knows it. One doesn't need to be told about it again, so that in fact you can give it a whole new mise-en-scene by, by doing this kind of experimentation with left-hand figurations. In okay? a sense, you're doing what a, a knob twiddler would do, a, a man listening on his stereo. You're bringing up the left hand. Exactly, exactly. But you're doing it uh, for him. And I hope he'll do it as, along with me. What I would do immediately would be to turn <laughs> the left hand down in order to get what back to square What you would do one. would be to have a 1938 single speaker, um, you know, five pound playback equipment and uh, never touch the knob except to turn it on and off. Uh, but uh, that's not true of today's listener, unfortunately. Happily. I suppose not. No, I suppose not. Uh, but when it comes to playing Beethoven, would it be right for me to say that in a way you are recomposing Beethoven? It would indeed. It would indeed. And I think that this is something that we must all do in this day and age. I think if one is going to pursue performance at a time when the greatest performances of the past and of the present have been made permanent in, in the record catalogues for everyone to hear, 
uh, one must indeed recompose it or, or find another way to make a living. I, I don't think there's an excuse for performance that simply duplicates what's been done before. Give me an example of, of how to supply us in Beethoven. All right. I'll give you the most radical example I can think of, and I don't really know whether it's possible quite to do this in the time that we have, because you know the third from the last sonata, the Opus 109, the one that begins with a chorale tune. This particular sonata has a feature in it that is so extraordinary that it almost defies description. In fact, two years ago in New York, I spent an entire evening at Hunter College giving a lecture and doing nothing but explaining really four bars out of that first movement of that sonata. And what I tried to suggest to them was that there was a procedure in those four bars which, if intentional on Beethoven's part, and, and I was not there to judge whether it was or not, but if intentional, was one of those moments of blinding inspiration, uh, so electric that it, it upset uh, the current of, of the, the romantic generation. It indeed was uh, the first instance of Arnold Schoenberg's musical thinking in, in music. Uh -huh. Because what Beethoven had in fact done was to follow a procedure in his recapitulation so totally different from what he had done in the um, exposition as to turn it around with the kind of mirror effect that Schoenberg would have used. Um, because, as you know, Beethoven normally, and indeed all composers of his period, normally more or less stuck to the, the format of the exposition of the various themes. In, they repeated in the, the material. material. Yes, indeed. Slightly what modified. Beethoven did, well, he wasn't even concerned about themes. In fact, the whole movement is rather athematic in that sense. There are no really good tunes, nothing you can whistle from it, mm -hmm. uh, not even the chorale tune, because it's, it's sort of... But what he did, in fact, was to be interested in root progression, which is to say not only in the bass notes, but in the notes that actually form the basis of certain chords, the low chords, and to, to put a mirror to this and turn a progression entirely upside down from it. We know at, in his later years that Beethoven became very interested in this kind of numerological trick. I mean, we have a lot of evidence for that. Um, the, uh, the Hammer Clavier Sonata has a fugue, for instance, which at a certain point, if you indeed hold up a mirror to it, you will find the statement of, of a very long embroidered subject um, reproduced in such a way that it even fits on the particular ledger lines that you can read it upside down. It's an incredible trick. And um, it only remains to say that, that no one really knows for sure how cocky Beethoven was about these things, whether he wanted us to notice them, whether he noticed them altogether. He certainly, I'm sure he did in that fugue subject, but I'm not at all sure that he, that he noticed this. Uh, it could well be that it was simply one of those incredible strokes uh, one of those incredible happenings, really, you know, that, that struck his path. But in any case, um, if it was something of which he was conscious, uh, or indeed if the, the departure that led to it uh, was even an act of uh, rational process, then what it did, in fact, was to bridge about 50 years that lay ahead beyond Tristan and up to the earliest days of Schoenberg. So that when one plays that sonata, complicated though that description sounds, one can never forget that, having made a discovery like that. It is entirely possible that you, as a performer, know more about the structure of that piece than the composer may have done. That sounds no. a, a terribly arrogant statement, I know. But it, it's, it, is, it is possible. Well, I can't say it's true. It is possible. Um, well, if you, pick out, if you were going to play this now, could you just pick out the, uh, the, right. the, the yes. headlines yes. first? Yes, well, the, the headlines that I'm concerned with are the, the recapitulation of, of this theme, which I will first play in, it, in its original form. <laughs> stanza. Now in the return, now up to here it's a carbon copy exactly. of those last chords, if it is derived in the way I think it is, has something to do with medieval alchemy. I mean, they sound like perfectly acceptable chords, and the only proof of the fact that Beethoven may well have been cognizant of all this, as the great mind that he was, um, 
is the fact that he applies to them sforzandos and fortissimos to draw our attention to them. Yes, will you draw the, my attention to them once more? Once Just more? the actual yes. chords. As against this, which would have been a more diatonic statement of the same sort of thing. It would still be an inversion, and that in itself would, would be an upset at that period in history. Well, but these, are, these, I think, are problems that, that uh, are insoluble, really. But they, they sort of stigmatize you to the extent that, that um, one can never escape their presence when you, when you play such a work again. You, as an interpreter, feel quite differently about the piece since you discovered this. Indeed, indeed. I can't escape that feeling now.